All you have to do is look at the kings and queens of some European countries to say and see that madness sort of runs in the family in some of those very well documented families. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to go from parent to child. It kind of pops up here and there. It wanders and meanders. It's not a recessive trait. It's not like you need two schizophrenics to have a child in order to have a child. It's a, a very murky genetic pattern, and that has created a whole other second school of thought among psychoanalysts, including Freud, who said, this is something the parents cause. This is something childhood trauma triggered forever. And it continues today, even in the genetic age. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all doing well. I think this may be eight weeks since we've been sheltering at home, and I'm just wishing you all the best because I know this is not an easy time for a lot of us. I'm so grateful to you for subscribing on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It means so much to me. And hey, if you can write me a five-star review, that's even better. That really helps me grow. So I'm so excited to bring you this week's episode. I know every other episode I've been doing solo podcasts, but I wanted to bring you Robert Kolker's episode so that you could read along with Oprah Winfrey in her book club. Enjoy everyone and take care of yourself. Robert Kolker's book, Hidden Valley Road, is currently Oprah's book pick and it's already at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. He's also the best-selling author of Lost Girls, which is now a Netflix movie, and it's named one of New York Times' 100 notable books and one of Publishers Weekly's top 10 books of 2013. As a journalist, his work has appeared in New York Magazine, Bloomberg Businessweek, The New York Times Magazine, Wire, GQ, O Magazine, and Men's Journal. He's a National Magazine Award finalist and a recipient of the Guggenheim Award for Excellence in Criminal Justice Reporting. In Robert's masterpiece, Hidden Valley Road, he takes us into the unbelievable story of a mid-century American family with 12 children, and six of them are diagnosed with schizophrenia, and it's with incredible clarity and compassion. The Galvins, They've been called the most mentally ill family in America, and for years they were silenced by shame. They're also one of the first families to be studied by the National Institute on Mental Health back in the 80s, and they helped us study genetics for future generations to come. I am so thrilled that Robert is here today to share this epic true family saga of how the Galvins became science's great hope in the quest to understand schizophrenia. Welcome, Robert. Hi, thanks so Hi. much for being on your show. And thanks for your very, very early interest in this book. You really reached out a long time ago before a lot of the heavy duty promotion for the book happened and you showed a real enthusiasm for it. So I'm really pleased. Oh my to goodness. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but I just, I hope that you're doing well during these really unprecedented times. And I just want to share a, a quick little personal anecdote with you. And that is that in the late eighties, when I told my grandfather that I wanted to study psychology, I went, I ended up going on to become a teacher. My grandfather was a medical doctor and he served under general Patton and he ended up making house calls, you know, delivering babies, you know, a traditional doctor. And he thought the idea of psychology, and I'm going to quote him, was a bunch of bullshit and malarkey. <laughs> or actually, he called it horse shit. And, you know, I just remember those words and thinking like, why is a medical doctor thinking so poorly about psychology? And um, what I love about your book is it's not only an incredible family saga that really truly read like fiction in many ways, and you kind of can't believe it's true, but it's also a history and a science lesson. And you, you've you married all of those things so well. And it, a science and a history lesson about just psychology and schizophrenia in general. You are a clearly very seasoned writer. 
and a reporter and you know how to get the truth out of people. And so I just want to tell you, I'm very honored to be interviewing you today. And as you mentioned, I reached out early because my husband had sent me an article about your book that was coming out. And I thought, oh my God, this is exactly what I'm talking about is ridding the stigma and families and shame and mental health and how it affects everyone. So when I reached out, I was thrilled you said yes. And then Weeks later, or maybe month, a month later, I found Oprah picks your book. Oh my gosh, so <laughs> exciting. I got to watch Oprah on Instagram Live with you pop a bottle of champagne and announce that you are a New York Times bestseller. To me, that has to be an author's dream. So what was it like getting that call from Oprah? It was surreal. I, I should say that, first of all, I'm very grateful to her. And the family, uh, what a thing for them to have put themselves on the line by being public for the first time about their lives. And then to have someone like her stand up and, and want people to pay attention to their story. It's been a very good thing for them as well. But at the time, you know, that wasn't anything that was on my radar. Oprah's Book Club tends to choose fiction. Right. And, um, and so it, it never, I didn't even like go to bed at night dreaming that maybe Oprah might uh, call. But she did call and I picked up the phone and she said, this is Oprah Winfrey. And I burst out laughing because uh, I, I knew there could be only one reason why she was calling. It was not one of those things where I go like, oh, you're playing a joke on me. You know, th this isn't really Oprah. It, she sounds like Oprah Winfrey when she's oh on the show. Oh my God. I mean, she's and she was queen, really so. enjoying being the one to break the news. So that was, it was, it was a really nice call. That is a moment you will never forget, truly. Because this is a podcast called Dear Family. I'd love to just hear about your family. Sure. I mean, I had a, compared to the Galvin family who I wrote about in the story, I had a pretty mellow childhood. I was a suburban kid. My family's a Baltimore family, but I grew up in the suburbs. My family has since moved back to Baltimore. And I left to go to college at Columbia University in New York, and I've been a New Yorker ever since. I have an older brother and an older sister. I'm the youngest in my family. What might be relevant for the book is that when I was in elementary school, my mother, yeah, I was her third kid. She went back for a master's degree in counseling psychology and became a psychiatric counselor at our local hospital. So she worked in the in the section of the hospital where there might be people with schizophrenia or um, people with suicide attempts or people who had been in a car accident and were traumatized, you know, for a couple of days. So she saw a wide variety of people and was really she was not a theoretician. Like she didn't come home and talk about Freud and Jung, but she she had a very practical approach. But she was very good at listening. She was a, a real active listener. She died in 2018. And, but when I think about my reporting style and my, my desire to tell the stories of people facing adversity, I think a lot about uh, her these days, for sure. I love that. I love that you got that understanding of the importance of listening to others, which really, I'm sure, translates into everything you do and all your writing. I know that you have also written another New York Times bestselling book, which I have not had the pleasure to read yet, called Lost Girls, and it's now a Netflix series. Do you want to just briefly tell our listeners about the book? Sure. This is another book about troubled families, but it's a really a true crime book and a social issues book. It's about an unsolved series of murders in Long Island. Killer hasn't been caught, and I very, 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 very early in the case, I spent time with the family members of the five women who were victims in this case. And so I wrote about the, the young women's lives, about families and what happened to them once they became at the center of this case. And it's a way of looking at a whole section of America, of working class America, that a lot of Americans may overlook sometimes. It's also about prostitution in the internet age. And it's also a crime book. And it, it was an unusual little book, but it really hit a really big moment because about a year or two after it came out, there was serial and making a murder murderer and suddenly true crime became ha, had a bit of a boom and so the book kind of floated on that and then it's also a story about listening to women who have been neglected so I think it's been connected a lot with the me too sensibility so it's had a, a real life of its own that I'm very proud of and then this movie on Netflix is really wonderful too I had no creative role in it but I'm just lucky it turned out wonderful and the director Liz Garbus who's a very socially conscious documentarian this is her first feature film and she did a wonderful job the acting's wonderful Amy Ryan and Gabriel Byrne are terrific in it. Wow, so I'm what a pleased with it. I, I'm sorry, I called it a series, so it's a movie. Um, now let's talk about Hidden Valley Road, which I absolutely adored. You were able to interview every surviving member, except three of the boys who were 
deceased. And you also got to interview Mimi, the matriarch, which I think how amazing that you got to interview her before she passed away. Um, but I know that your main contact was Mary, who later changed her name to Lindsay. Curious if you could just give us a little rundown about what Lindsay was like. She and her older sister, Margaret, who are the only two girls in the family, they're the youngest in the family, and they'd been talking one way or another about letting the world know about their family for decades. And Margaret, her si- Lindsay's sister in particular, had been doing you know dream journaling about it and diary keeping for decades about this. So when they finally came to me about four years ago, they had been they had thought it through a million different ways, and they decided that there were things about their older brothers that they knew nothing about, and that perhaps an outsider would be better off investigating, whether it was through interviews or digging into medical records or or talking to experts or writing about the science part of it. It was a bit of a tall order. And so they talked to a mutual friend of ours. Lindsay went to high school with one of my great friends who edited me at New York Magazine for many years. His name is John Gluck. And when they were in high school together, of course, Lindsay wasn't talking about her family. She was trying to run away from her family at that point and not make it a part of her life. But as they stayed in touch over the years, he got the gist and learned a bit. And then finally, she came to him and said, we're ready to look for someone outside the family to do this. And he thought of me because while I had done a lot of this true crime book, Lost Girls, he he understood that really the crux of the book was well, ordinary people facing very difficult situations and trying to come through the other side a little wiser. And so he saw that I would be a good match for it, which was a wonderful thing. Well, and I think what makes it so rich truly is the investigative aspect. Like I said, married with all of the facts and the history and and you weave it in so well. In the book, you mentioned that nearly half of all young school shooters have symptoms of developing schizophrenia. I'm just curious why you think there was so much violence among these schizophrenic brothers. Do you think violence Um, is related? I do not think that violence is necessarily a byproduct of schizophrenia. And I I think it's an uncomfortable topic to discuss because I think it's frightening to see someone with schizophrenia because they seem so detached from reality. But I do think when it's kept in the dark and when people are in denial about it and when when no one is seeking help for it, what it means is that you, in a family where there's a lot of the illness, that these young boys are bouncing up against one another and becoming increasingly anxious and trying to control their surroundings any way they can. And if you're if you're a 13, 14, 15 year old boy, that's going to mean the 24 hour wrestling match. And that's what happened in this household. And this is the late 1950s and early 1960s. The parents were able to rationalize this 10 different ways. They said, boys will be boys. We're a military family. It's unrealistic to think that they're all going to be sitting around smoking the peace pipe. They'll grow out of it. We shouldn't get involved because we would be coddling them and they'll never learn to stand on their own two feet. And then finally, the biggest one is if they looked at it the other way and said, maybe uh, are our boys showing the early signs of mental illness, even if they were that savvy, which no one in the 50s was, the next step would be to have to go public about it. And back in those days, most psycho analysts were blaming the parents for this illness, which meant that they immediately would be judged. The whole family would come crashing down. Don would lose his job. His career would be over. They'd be in the street. In a way, the the most rational decision they could make was, let's hope for the best and hope this gets better. Yeah. And, you know, um, one of the things I do is I volunteer for NAMI. I'm not doing this now, but where I go into high schools and um, and middle schools, and we talk about how people with mental illness are often stigmatized because we assume if you're schizophrenic, you might become violent, for example. It's that this is not ne- true necessarily. But often it's people that have schizophrenia that are the ones that get bullied and victimized. And so, you know, it, it's just an interesting thought to just keep in mind that, you know, just because there's schizophrenia does not mean there's violence. It's it's all these other factors, which I think are important to remember. Mm-hmm. And what was it like interviewing the three surviving schizophrenic boys? I knew very early on that, that one of the real challenges of the book would be to make sure that the mentally ill siblings that the brothers all emerged as real human beings. I didn't want to write a book where I would say, you know, and then Joe went crazy and then move on to the next subject. I wanted people to see Joe the same way they would see Mark or or any of the mentally well siblings. I wasn't sure how that would pan out. But then in one of my first trips to Colorado, Lindsay took me by to meet the one by one, the three brothers, surviving brothers who were mentally ill. 
And it became very clear that despite the fact that they all are limited now in their cognition, they all are very different people with very different manifestations of mental illness. Schizophrenia is, is, a, is a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms. It's not one disease. So it makes sense that even though six brothers have it, they all manifest it differently. And in fact, that's true of a lot of things. Like you can, you can pass a cold around to your family, but one person will get the sniffles and the other one will have a sore throat. Not the best analogy in the world, but that seems to be what's happened well, here. Well, that makes sense with 12 siblings and every one of them's different and yet it's the same parents, right? So it's, right. again, so much of what you talk about is genetics and heredity and yet There's all these different factors, both environmental and biological. The imagery of Mimi and Dawn domesticating hawks in Colorado is pioneer forward, beautiful imagery. And it's so dichotomous with raising these boys that have schizophrenia that are in so many words, untamable. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I think at a very basic level, the, the Galvins were overconfident in their ability to overcome adversity the same way that, you know, perhaps America after the war was, in, was riding a huge wave of confidence that then got questioned at various points later. I didn't want to hit that too hard, but it certainly is a thing you can think about as you, as you look at the book. To their credit, I mean, Don and Mimi were a very daring couple that were, they were ready to move across the country and start a new life. They were, once they, they discovered falconry together and decided that they could fly falcons. These are city kids who grown up in Queens suddenly doing this. They felt like they could take on anything and with enough hard work and enough discipline and enough dedication, they'd be able to master it. And I thought that that was a good way to introduce you to them so that you get a feel for who they are as people and then also see what happens once something hits them that they really can't master that they can't control. It was a great dichotomy. It it worked very well. And why do you think Mimi kept having children? Do you think she wanted to, or do you think it was really because it was something Don wanted? I know one of the first reactions from people when I tell them about this family is, well, why did they keep having children if the six of them were sick? The short answer is that the most of the time schizophrenia doesn't really manifest until one's early 20s, till the end of adolescence. And that's what happened here. All 12 children were born before it became clear that there was severe mental illness at work. But that doesn't get to the question you asked, which is why have 12 children to begin with? They, they were not unique in town in Colorado Springs. There were other large families there, Catholic families like them, but they were unique in their family. It's not like, oh, all the Galvins have a lot of kids, so we're going to have a lot of kids. And people in their own family were on both sides were asking them, why are you having so many children? So it's a, I think it's a worthwhile question to ask. And I worked for a long time to get a lot of different points of view on that. On the one hand, I think they both enjoyed having lives of distinction and standing out in their community and feeling accomplished in that way. And that that having so many children made them feel special in a certain way. So it's not just, you know, Don isn't just a military guy who one day is going to punch out and retire. He's the paterfamilias of a family of 12. And Mimi is not just a smart woman who quit college to follow her husband across the country and, and wash the dishes the rest of her life. She's the mother of this huge, wonderful, amazing, perfect family. So that was important to them. But that's, I don't think, gives Mimi enough credit. I, I think that's, that's too mean to her. And I, my other thought about her is that she was filling some holes in her life, some emotional holes. She had a father who, who was basically kicked out of the family after a scandal when she was very young. She never really saw him again. Now she had a husband who was increasingly absent, as a lot of 50s dads were, just working all the time. And and having a life outside the house. Having the children was a way to create a a new family for herself, to create some more company for herself, to solve some of those problems. That's my suspicion. And maybe she was also trying for those girls. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) Well, I know at least 3 million Americans, so that's 1% of our population, suffer from schizophrenia. For so long, schizophrenia has been misunderstood, and I think in many respects it still is. As you said, at one point, mothers were the ones that were being blamed or maybe mentally ill people were being sterilized. You mentioned this earlier that schizophrenia is not really a disease, but rather a collection of symptoms. Can you explain why it's a disease of theories? No one really knows what it is. And then that, that's a strange thing to be talking about in 2020, but it's certainly true. You know, there, there was a, a fantastic psychiatrist, an expert in schizophrenia, who Oprah had on Instagram Live the other night as part of Oprah's book club, you know, to talk about schizophrenia. And even he was, you know, 
kept saying, we don't know to half of the questions that were being asked. We're, we're still, it's still really early days. However, that doesn't keep people from writing books about it and giving opinions on it. And from the very beginning, there was a, a debate about where it came from. Was it nature or was it nurture? And at the beginning, that seems like kind of a silly question because all you have to do is look at the kings and queens of some European countries to say and see that madness sort of runs in the family in some of those very well-documented families. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to go from parent to child. It kind of pops up here and there. It wanders and meanders. It's not a recessive trait. It's not like you need two schizophrenics to have a child in order to have a child. It's a, a very murky genetic mm. pattern. And that has created a whole other second school of thought among psychoanalysts, including Freud, who said, this is something the parents cause. This is something childhood trauma triggers. And these are the two, de- this is the debate that's been going on forever. And it continues today, even in the genetic age, where we've sequenced the genome but all that's done is muddy the waters because now we see that there are hundreds of genes that all figure a tiny little amount in causing schizophrenia. And yet there are environmental triggers that might express those genes that people are still blaming on the environment, whether it's um, a childhood trauma of some sort or smoking marijuana, they're, they're concerned that there's an environmental trigger that hits vulnerable people. To answer your question, the theories just keep coming. There are a million theories about what might it be. Is it toxicity in cat litter? Is it a virus that gets passed along? Is it a product of child abuse? Everyone has a different lane that they've picked. We know that, as you said, it typically rears, schizophrenia typically rears its ugly head in adolescence and early adulthood, and there are often triggers. What do you think were some of the potential triggers that set some of the Galvin boys off? I mean, I know they were doing drugs. They were experimenting with acid, but not everyone that took acid ended up developing schizophrenia. Well, the family had had many, many years of wondering that same thing. And they all, they, they would, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, So they would look at different brothers and say, well, Donald really lost control entirely and had his big psychotic break after his wife announced that he was going to leave him. Peter had his major psychotic break three weeks after standing three feet away from his father while his father collapsed from a stroke. Joe was engaged and his girlfriend broke off the engagement and then he started writing threatening letters to the White House. There are lines that they can draw. For a while, the family thought, well, maybe it's about heartbreak. Maybe they each had their heart broken in different ways and that's what caused it or, or caused them to lose control. As you said, most of the time this illness appears in late adolescence. And researchers, it has not been lost on them that late adolescence is the final stage of brain development. And so for many years now, it's been thought that schizophrenia is what's called a developmental disorder, where your genes might telegraph the possibility that you get schizophrenia, but it's really in the end stages of brain development when your brain is installing the final operating system that's going to get things up and running where things start to get glitchy. The question becomes, how can we fortify the brain and strengthen it early on so that perhaps it won't lose its bearings later on in its development. And that that's where a lot of the research is right now. Is that why they're studying giving, is it choline to babies or mo- yep. pregnant mothers? One experiment that's happening with a researcher who uh, had worked with the Galvin family decades ago. Hidden Valley Road follows his research in a way that layman can understand, follows it chapter by chapter with all of his twists and turns from the time he meets the Galvins to the time he arrives at this idea that a very harmless nutritional supplement, choline, that you can buy at the vitamin shop is something that expectant mothers might be able to take to strengthen brain development. And the FDA has approved it for this purpose. They've, they issued a recommendation letter saying expectant mothers could help their kids this way. The question is, would it really lead to fewer incidents of schizophrenia later on? And we won't know for years until that's the case, but they're studying it now. And to me, it's just amazing that in a very meandering, twisty, turny way, it was the Galvin family and the the study of the Galvin family that helped Dr. Robert Friedman in Denver lead to this possibly revolutionary new strategy. They had no idea that they were contributing at the time, but that is really really great. And I know that you've also mentioned this, that brothers and sisters have a likely chance of having a child with schizophrenia, and yet it's not normally passed from father and mother to child. Yet in 1997, the first gene was discovered that was definitively associated with schizophrenia. Was that when the nature versus the nurture debate, specifically discrediting mothers, did that 
kind of stop that or was it just another thing thrown in the theories? The mother thing was really fading by the early 80s. The researchers who studied the Galvin family, who all came up in the 70s, they all told me, without exception, that when they were in medical school, there were still plenty of professors arguing that bad parenting caused it. But that by the early 80s, there were enough, they call them meta studies, you know, studies of different studies to try to check the work. Uh, that, that showed that there really is no correlation. And there's one scientist who has the best saying of all. He said that if bad parenting caused illnesses like schizophrenia, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. A lot of, a lot I of be, bad I parents. be schizophrenic. <laughs> exactly. I, it's not really so, something to joke about, but... But to get to your... your in 1997, the, yeah, Dr. Friedman, again, as an offshoot of his work that started with the Galvins, ends up identifying the first gene that is a player in schizophrenia, which you think would be a game changer. You'd think you'd say, okay, great. Let's find a way to medicate this gene or, or use a drug that can alter it and we'll solve the problem and we'll be done by dinner time. Not so much. I mean, the, the problem is that they found another gene and another and another and more than a hundred genetic mutations that all are players, that all are play a bit part supposedly in schizophrenia and they all pay such a tiny part that even if you had all 147 of these mutations, it still would increase the chance of you getting schizophrenia from 3% to 7%. You know, it, it, it just isn't, they have not found the smoking gun. They've only found a, a complicating factor. There's still a lot more to learn. This is one of the things that I talk a lot about in Dear Family, the picture perfect family on the outside. The image on the cover is all the boys on a staircase dressed beautifully and the mom standing and the dad standing, it, like a Hallmark card. It, it, was that a holiday card? It was at a, an event at the Air Force Academy where oh. Don, the father, had a teacher. And I guess everyone likes getting their pictures taken on those stairs. It's oh, a big assignment. Okay. Okay. They would be the perfect family to pose for a picture there. Um, so, yeah, there are many of them. So exactly. So the quote unquote perfect family, right? Mimi even said, and I'm going to quote her. She said, I thought I was such a good mother. I baked a cake and a pie every night or at least had jello with whipped cream, end quote. But behind Mimi and Don's Hidden Valley Road closed door, it was much different. Don and Mimi, and this is what's so great about this story, they, on the outside, they looked like this perfect American family, a military father married to a mother who sewed all her children's clothes. At one point, Mimi even ended up kind of getting close to feeling what that would be like, right? She was rubbing elbows with governors and Rockefellers, but then she never really had the wealth she wanted. She was just trying to keep these appearances on to the outside world, which is, I think, part of that denial, where some of that denial came in. They also worried that it would be a reflection on their parenting if they said anything to the doctors. So they kept quiet. The perfect Christmas card or that perfect image, that dichotomy of the total chaos behind the closed doors, the sexual abuse, the violence. I mean, this book exactly illustrates that shame of family secrets. And I'm just wondering if you can just expand on that. That is the part of, of the book that I think is potentially relatable for people. Even if schizophrenia hasn't touched your life directly, you certainly can look back at, at things that have been papered over in your family and, and you see the damage that the secrets can do over time. In this particular instance, you have a, a mother who is all the things you said, you know, she does, she's invested in perfection. But then once there is no way to cover up what's happened, she becomes this very high energy crusader to try to take care of her boys herself, which again, may have been a bad idea for the boys and certainly a bad idea for the well children who get overlooked and neglected and one even gets sent away. You know, it, it, they, they feel like their mother has really forsaken them, but she keeps the family together in a strange way. She she becomes this crusader for, on behalf of her sons that, that allows the family to be together to the point where researchers actually can find them and study them. So the blinders that she's had on all her life, they are sometimes bad and sometimes good. I hope readers will read the first part of Hidden Valley Road and see perhaps a very critical view of Mimi. But then later on, as happens with all of us when we grow up and, and become parents ourselves or become adults ourselves, we look at our parents with different eyes and maybe we still disagree with a lot of their decisions, but we see a broader context. We, we see other things that they've done as well. And that feels real to me. So I, I was glad to be able to tell that story. In no way is Mimi a villain in the book, I think. She's neither no, here nor a villain. Not at all. I mean, you can feel sympathy. Who was the 
first person to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Ironically, it was one of the mentally ill sons. It was the second son, Jim, who saw that the his main rival in life, his older brother Donald, was collapsing and had come home to live at home, even though he was in his mid-20s. And Mimi was trying to, and Don were trying to make lemonade out of lemons and keep on moving and hope to get Donald back up on his own two feet. Jim was the truth teller who would come by in his sports car and berate Donald for ruining their family and very, very angrily criticize everybody for letting him still be around. Of course, within a year, Jim himself would have his own side psychotic break and do even more damage than Donald ever did in his life. It took a little while longer for the family to really own up to what was happening. It took the murder-suicide in 1973 to really get the family so shaken up that there was no point in bothering covering up anything anymore. Speaking of Jim, his molestation of his sisters was very disturbing. They were so young and Mimi didn't recognize it and was, I'm sure that the girls still question that to this day. When Mimi was finally confronted, she used mental illness as an excuse. There just were so many topics not discussed and and that just got swept under the rug because I'm assuming Lindsay had to ask her mom if it was okay to go public with this story. What made Mimi decide, yes, let's tell the truth to the world? By the time I met Mimi in 2016, not just Dr. Robert Friedman in Colorado, but Dr. Lindsay in Delisi in Massachusetts had come through with lots of big advances in our understanding of schizophrenia. These separate sets of research both sprung out of their work with the Galvins decades earlier. So Mimi was very happy that genetics had been confirmed as a, as a major factor in, in the family illness. And she no longer felt judged the way that she had for so many years early on. And so when her daughters came to her for the 170th time and said, we'd like to go forward with this project, she was up for it now. And she was, so it was good timing. She was ready. Good thing because she was 90 or 91 years old at the time and very frail. So it's good that she felt comfortable doing that. And I'm sure the girls feel good knowing that she gave her blessing. I'm going to quote the book, quote, even if just one child has schizophrenia, everything about the internal logic of that family changes, end of quote. You can imagine if there are six kids that are dealing with mental illness, how that's going to change. I really began my podcasting and my writing because I really think that mental health affects an entire family even if you don't have a disorder yourself. The other six of the 12 Galvin kids, they were affected negatively, whether they felt neglected or they were worried about tomorrow, I'm going to be the next one having to go into the mental hospital. I think of some of the uh, the brothers that were quote unquote sane, like John, the scholarly musician who followed the two brothers that were violent. And I'm wondering, well, first of all, question, did you ever get to hear any of his music? I picture it being very like pained. <laughs> <laughs> he and his wife are both musicians and they're both really talented and very, you know, they play classical. They also restore old pianos. They're both really talented. John was in that 24 hour wrestling match for so long that when he was in college, in the middle of college, he got married and then they split. They left for Idaho and came home back home to Colorado only occasionally. And that is an understandable outcome from someone who felt so endangered as a young kid. He also maintained, you know, ties to the family. He didn't deny them. It's just he kept his destiny. It was his coping mechanism to escape. And then I also think of Michael, the fifth child, who had three older brothers who were sick, and he ended up becoming a hippie and living on a commune, like so different than the military family, right? And and he tried going back to fix things with like brown rice and meditation, which which I love. There's, there's got to be one in the family like that. <laughs> Did Mimi ever acknowledge that she neglected her healthy kid? I think she did her best to deflect that sort of criticism. And it wore on her after a while. And some at some point, she tried to make it clear that, that she was dealing with more than she had let on, that there were problems with her husband, fidelities. There are all sorts of things that she brings up later saying, hey, you know, you guys think I'm this wicked witch, but look at it. Look at everything that I was trying to deal with. I was overwhelmed. And she didn't really back down from that. There was no moment where she turned and said, please forgive me for everything I've done wrong. And I think that speaks to her on point personality. Like she's trying very hard to push forward constantly, no matter what. And that that helps the situation 
even as it also hurt the situation too. And I really related to the quote, if you go to the heart of the matter, you will find only by loving and helping do you have peace from your own trauma. After Mimi's son Brian's death and her husband Don's stroke, you talk about how Mimi never did give up on her sick kids, which she's a very sympathetic character because you realize like she's a mom that wants to love her children. And I cried when I got to the point where Lindsay finally had this kind of breakthrough with her therapist, even though she called it 25 years seep through, (laughs) which I love because it's not always that aha moment where everything changes. I have a family with a lot of mental health issues. And had I not forgiven my mom and understood behavior stemmed from mania or depression, we would not be as tight and close as we are. And I think of Lindsay, she is such a forgiving woman. Just curious how forgiveness plays into this story. Yes, that quote that you read, that is Lindsay talking. And she has, after a childhood of dreaming of getting away from the Galvin family, she found that her route toward getting past trauma was to run right straight back in and be as involved in the care of the sick brothers as Mimi ever was. It's frustrating for her. It's a hard work and it's all consuming. She's really become an activist for mental health issues as well. To her, it is her pathway toward leading a happy and functional life. And I should point out both Margaret and Lindsay, you know, if you ran into them on the ski slopes or on at the Whole Foods or whatever, you would say, oh, that's a nice person. It's not their issues are their issues, but they are functional, happy people. I was inspired by both of them in their way. Margaret's journey is involves the setting up of more boundaries. Um, But it's about self-care and moving past trauma as well. And she has a lot to teach people too. I think that it's it's similar to anxiety. Like if you don't lean into something, it's going to come back at you even harder. And I really appreciate that Lindsay and Margaret, they leaned into this and said, we're going to take care of our family. Family is what's important. And we're going to not turn a blind eye. What are your thoughts on early intervention? I wonder, have the boys been diagnosed earlier and maybe given Thorazine earlier? Do you think things could have been different? I do. I think if a family like the Galvins existed now, there still would be a stigma, but nothing like the one that existed way back then. And that it would be likely that the kids would have warning signs earlier before their big psychotic breaks and that they could have early interventions, which include medication and some therapy as well. It's early days now, and it's not clear whether early intervention is how powerful it is. But in some instances, it's been shown to be really, really helpful. I mean, the, the fact is that every time you have a psychotic break, it gets harder and harder to climb back out. So what if instead of having 15 or 20 psychotic breaks, like some of the Galvin boys, you just had two or three, and then were stabilized with medication, then then there wouldn't be as much hardcore damage to your executive function, and you could live independently. It could be potentially a game changer for a lot of people. Not to mention your self-esteem, knowing that you're acting this way because you truly are dealing with a mental illness there'd be more sympathy and compassion within a family. And I wonder about those things with my grandma who took her life in the 60s and had all of these dialogues been happening. I think things would have been different. At the end of the book, you mentioned neurodiversity. What is that? Before I researched this book, I knew about it with regards to autism, because that's a big topic of conversation now. Rather than calling autism an illness, a sickness, there are people who, and there's this is like this with lots of mental illnesses and brain diseases, who, who say that, that that is an ableist designation, that it's, that it's better to look at people as people and not as diseases. With, when, with regard to schizophrenia, there is definitely a, a school of thought out there, a segment of people who are very concerned to call schizophrenia a disease and to decide, even though it's not really accurate, that drugs are the answer is a way of basically dehumanizing people. And it's a pathway, and they believe it's a pathway toward eugenics. They think the next step in that is sterilization and, and trying to breed it out of people. Their alarm bells are going off significantly. So in schizophrenia, a lot of people who believe in neurodiversity uh, subscribe to what's called the hearing voices movement, which is a very interesting movement where of people who point out rightly so that a lot of people hear voices. You don't have to be clinically diagnosed schizophrenic by the, by the DSM to, to hear voices. And in the, the studies I've seen, one said it was like 5%, one said it was 7% of people 
out there, that's like more than one in 20 people have said that at one time or Very another, they've heard a voice. Yeah. Right. So, so what if all this really was on a spectrum? You know, what if rather than diseaseifying everything that's going on, we looked at it as symptoms to manage or even beyond symptoms, looked at them as people to be reckoned with. I think with some of the Galvin boys, they are panicked and so desperate and so sad and so anxious that they act out in some ways. What if they never get to that point? What if they're embraced and, and offered solace early on? Would it, would it make a difference? And these are open questions that, that I think can be explored with future cases. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you for talking about that. When I say mental illness or disorder, I like it gets caught in my throat because I, I understand that. my And what I try to say is my mom has bipolar, not that my mom is bipolar because she's more than right. her disorder. Last two questions. If you could write your younger 20-year-old Self, a dear Bob love letter. What does it say? Knowing what you know now. I don't have any diagnosis, but I certainly run toward anxiety and have a slightly obsessive style. And that can be very helpful to me as a journalist because you get very detail oriented and you try to solve all the problems and, and get through all the issues. But it, to 20 year old me, I would say to, to have more compassion for myself and a little more patience and to be more flexible and curious about things that are happening to me and not so impatient and worried about bad outcomes. I would probably tell myself something similar. I am a very impatient person and I and I think learning to be compassionate for yourself is really important. Do you have any happiness habits? Is there anything that you do that brings you joy? I It's taken me decades, but I finally am a regular uh, runner or jogger. Like I jog three times a week and ran a half marathon for the first time while working on this book. So, uh, the, and, oh, and I, congratulations. I, I can honestly say that brings me joy that just the, not just the, I imagine the endorphins have a lot to do with it, but just out there feeling the breeze is just great. When I'm working, I try every now and then to remind myself to loosen up a little bit. And I ask myself the rhetorical question, what if this were fun? <laughs> <laughs> because you know, often I'm, so, I'm so tied up in knots thinking, oh, this is such hard work. This is so tricky. It's it's a good way to kind of untie the knots and be like, wait, what if you what if this were enjoyable? What if you if you were having fun with this, how would you do it? And that kind of gets me through some of the more difficult moments. And so, are you able to run in Brooklyn right now? Yes. Oh, good. You just throw a little cloth covering over your face and and Perfect. stay away from people, and it works out. It's been fun. it's been a been a good thing at the moment for sure. Well, I will have in your show notes your link to your book and to your social media on Twitter and Facebook. Well, I'm really thrilled that a show like yours that focuses on mental health is focusing on this book. It's just great. Oh, just thank great. you thank so you. much. Really, truly, I am so grateful and honored to have had this time to interview you. So thank you. And I wish you continued success. Your book is so important and I've been telling everyone to get it. Enjoy Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's great talking to you. What an accomplishment. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.